Einstein once said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Rudy Butenal is an educator, scholar, and TV man who uses his imagination to run Knowledge Network, BC's public broadcaster. And it is my pleasure to welcome Rudy Butenal to Studio 4 to tell us more about imagination and knowledge and that network. <laughs> well, um, Knowledge Network is British Columbia's public educational broadcaster and uh, four years ago we took it into the uh, digital era and so mm. now we're available on television online in mobile anywhere anytime okay and does every province have a a, a knowledge type network um, a, f a few of them do uh, Quebec has tele Quebec TV Ontario has a t or TVO Sorry, Ontario has uh, TV Ontario and uh, TFO, the French language service, right. and there's Knowledge Network. There were two other provinces, but um, they've gone private since. Okay, like Access, wasn't there an Access Alberta? Yes, there was. There was Access Alberta. It, went, it was privatized a number of years ago, and Saskatchewan privatized their service uh, mm. last year. What's different for you about running a Knowledge Network as opposed to... A regular old TV station. Well, I've not run a regular old TV <laughs> station, so I don't know, but I can tell you what it's like running a public service. Mm -hmm. uh, we're like the operators of a Stanley Park in a big urbanized environment. Mm. Um, in other words, we don't compete against the commercial system. We complement it. We make um, the environment a different alternative. And I love running a, a public service in the sense that our job is to speak to uh, the citizen, the resident. And uh, everything we do on our service is directed at uh, a British Columbian, not an advertiser. And so okay. that's a different thing. Sure. And when you landed yes. at Knowledge, uh, and and attempted and wanted to and did put your brand on Knowledge Network, uh, Rudy's version of Knowledge <laughs> yeah. Network. What did you change? Well, I think the hardest thing to change is the culture, and we uh, I think we're um, we were part of an educational institution. Um, we didn't see ourselves as being uh, competitive and out there, and I think we had to. Uh, Aside from going from the analog era of running a single television station, we right. had to become a programming service that was available anywhere and really focus the attention on what the viewer saw at home, whether it was on their TV set, on their computer, on their mobile. That's how we're judged, you know, what the viewer sees, not how well we make our, we make our programs or how well we right. uh, do our accounting. Okay, and somebody said, perhaps it was you, people who know us love us. Yes. But some people who love us don't know us. That's or right. don't know it's us. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. In fact, um, I, I, I think we had a really low profile mm -hmm. for the longest time. And as a result, when people would think of public television, they would send their, um, their donations uh, south of the border to the American PBS sure. system. Sure. Uh, Detroit Public, uh, PBS. In this case, Seattle takes Seattle. about a third of their funding. Uh, their their uh, charitable donations come from the Lower Mainland. And, um, and we, we also um, work on charitable contributions. We have 33,000 donors that give us about 30% of our budget every year. So we had to change the idea around that when you're thinking about uh, contributing to public television, you should consider British Columbia's public broadcaster in your plans. Okay, so at that point, there's B we BC's public broadcaster, which is funded partially by us, the taxpayer, yes, through the government, right? Yes, it is. It's uh, it's an annual grant from the from the government, and we complement that with uh, charitable donations uh, from again about thirty three thousand okay. donors. When I watch the Charlie Rose show, yes, and I'm a fan uh, on PBS or Detroit Public. Yes, I guess it's all the same, sort of. Well, it's a you know it's not a network. It's a system of three hundred and sixty odd independent stations. Okay. that work as a cooperative. Sure, I see the Charlie Rose show brought to you by foundations and I think somebody's brought to you by Coca-Cola and yes. major sponsors. So are they sponsors or advertisers? How does that work? Well, Do we have it here? Uh, we have a version of it here, not as successful. Um, in, I worked at PBS uh, in mm. Texas, in Houston for a long time, so I'm a big fan of, of, of the PBS and I consider them our, our American cousins. And uh, they're very successful in getting private sector uh, corporations to underwrite the schedule. They don't, they don't do advertising, but what they'll do is, as part of their philanthropic uh, uh, initiatives, is they'll support programming like the Charlie Rose sure. program. Okay. And, and how did you get into uh, the television business, uh, into a dark room, into an editing <laughs> suite? How did that begin? Well, it, it started as, uh, I think, as a 12-year-old. I was... Um, 
it starts back there. With my, I used to watch the Academy Awards, the Oscars with my mom, and uh, at 12 years old, I turned around one day and said, you know what, one day I'm gonna be in that business. And at 14, I started to make uh, my own films. It was called, there weren't media studies at the time. It was, I took a independent English, <laughs> and I decided <laughs> to make a film. And it was a take on George Orwell's 1984. Really? So, yeah, it was a Super 8 film. I think, you know, when I look back at it now, I won't show it to anybody because it involves a lot of running around and, you know, <laughs> torture scenes. And that mm -hmm. kind of. But at 14, if you even knew about 1984 and yeah. Orwell and you were that smart, obviously you had some skills. Well, um, I think I developed the skills. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I didn't know. And, uh, of course, I, th I think to this day that the reason that I decided to make a film instead of a group presentation is I thought it would probably be easier to make a film. Never uh -huh. worked harder in my life and took forever to make it. Mm -hmm. And when I finished it, the teacher liked it so much, she, uh, at the next school assembly, I got to show my film to the entire school. And at the end of that film, I got an applause. And the rest is history. I yes. said, I like that. <laughs> Any Academy Awards? <laughs> well, I was the chairman of our Canadian Academy of Cinema mm -hmm. and Television for seven years. So I've been on the stage a few times. And uh, the closest I got when I was a commissioning editor at my former public network was an Oscar nomination for a short that I uh, commissioned. So How great. That was close. And documentary, <laughs> your first love? Making my, documentary? Yeah, I, I love documentary and it started really from my, um, in an attempt to learn English, because English is a second language for me, having come from Italy as a little boy, uh, my mom used to buy me Life magazine, or bring, bring home old copies of Life magazine, mm -hmm. and I would look at the photographs and read the captions and help improve my English skills. And it, in the process, loved uh, social documentary, journal, photojournalism, and that kind of, I think that's, it came from photography, really. Mm, really. What makes a great documentary, in your opinion? Key elements, great documentary. It, it, a, a great story with a, a, um, a, a real-life character going through a real-life um, obstacles and surmounting them. I mean, mm. it's the classic journey of a hero, but told in real, unmanipulated terms. Yes. And uh, all, all truth, nothing but the truth. Yeah. So help you, documentary maker. You know, uh, it's the truth, that thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the truth. Yes. As far as the documentary filmmaker knows it, you know, I think it's important that uh, the filmmaker be honest with their material and that they present the truth as far as they know it. Right. So when you were at TV Ontario, did, is that where you you ran the corporation and some of those documentaries, uh, Let It Come Down, The Life of Paul Bowles, Memory for Max, or was that another yeah. incarnation? No, no, it was at TVO. I was um, recruited to uh, run the independent model. Uh, then worldwide, a lot of networks produced their documentaries in-house, and there was a worldwide movement to work with the independent sector. I was brought in to change the model from doing in-house productions to commissioning mm. totally independent filmmakers. And I decided to do a point of view strand, a creative documentary strand, where the filmmaker got to do whatever, you know, what they wanted to do with as, min as few restrictions as possible. How great. Freedom. Freedom. I thought it was the rarest thing. And, uh, you know, in a market mm. economy, it's go after the thing mm -hmm. that's most desirable and nobody else is doing it. So I commissioned the corporation and let them, it took them four years to do it. And I had a mantra for these, uh, this series of creative documentaries. Deliver it when it's done, not when it's due. You know, right. When you've finished your story, because they're like nonfiction novels. Mm -hmm. They can take two years, they can take 20 years. At the end of the day, you're only interested in a great story and yes. a great novel. And some of these films just take time. Exactly, and my uh, uh, friend Ted Chamberlain, who's a professor and writes books, he wrote a book called If This Is Your Land, Where Are Your Stories? And we are our stories. Yeah. If somebody has the, the, uh, the nugget of a documentary, an idea, and wants uh, it played on Knowledge Network, oh. is that possible? Yeah, very possible. We're um, One of the big changes uh, instituted at Knowledge Network four years ago was we eliminated in-house productions, so we would work exclusively with the independent sector because, again, it's my belief that independent filmmakers working close to the stories, um, you know, uh, can tell you what's happening. They're the ones that are closest to the environment and, mm -hmm. and uh, bring out the stories that you'd never hear of. And so we have uh, devoted our money, a lot of our original commissioning money, to original stories. We're open for business. Uh, people come to see our independent uh, production department. They submit their ideas at any stage, you know, from idea stage to work in progress to almost completed. And we'll get involved if we think it's a great story relevant to our viewers. So your litmus test for what makes great television uh, on knowledge day one, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, what do you look at? 
the mix? Well, you know, you're looking for um, a great story from a filmmaker that you think can deliver it and can bring the financing together in a timely manner and, del and, and will have something to say to some segment of the population. Okay, and to connect the province, because it's very yeah. BC-based, right? Well, we're BC, I think of it as a BC worldview. BC's, you know, the, the uh, population is changing, Canada's changing, immigration, particularly from Asia Pacific, is, mm -hmm. is, is changing both Canada and BC. And so what would be of interest to that mix? You know, and so it's the BC worldview we're interested in. It's a little more nebulous, but I think a lot more expansive sure. and open. And what about the education part of it, uh, connecting people? Education-wise, uh, education-wise, where we really focus in terms of uh, capital E education is our kids programming. We devote half our schedule from six in the morning to six in the evening to kids uh, programming, predominantly to uh, preschoolers and early school age kids. And everything we do in kids programming is aimed in some way to promote literacy or numeracy wrapped in good social values like caring and sharing. Sure, and the social media aspect, uh, doing business in the new media age. What's changed? Well, what's changed, we've relaunched our website, um, knowledge.ca, and we've now made it really easy for people that uh, haven't seen the television service. If they want to watch something, catch up viewing, they can watch it on, online uh, you can, with two clicks, and you can watch any show. Uh, most shows mm. uh, that you might have missed. You can also donate <laughs> online <laughs> yes. within two clicks. And that's yes. really important to us because, again, um, you know, 30% of our budget comes from people's uh, mm -hmm. charitable contributions. And it also shows that we're relevant uh, to the sure. province. So and it's tougher economic times, tougher to raise money today, they tell me. You know, it is. And yet in the last four years, including right through the heart of the, the Great Recession, our charitable donations have continued to go up, and we're raising 50% more now than we have uh, mm. four or five years ago. Sure, and I think there's a hunger for content. I mean, it's what drives us here in Studio Four, for sure. Content, great guests like yourself, <laughs> <laughs> she says, nice. to the good <laughs> Italian boy. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. give me some time, give me some conversation, tell me something I didn't know before, make me think, make me think. Uh, you know, I think that, that's, that's an incredibly, um, that's it. Uh, there isn't a lot of opportunity where you can sit down and have programming that makes you think. And, and uh, for me, that's the most important aspect of what we do. Does it get people talking? Does it make them, once they've seen a particular show, do they actually think about it when they go, mm -hmm. you know, when they do something else? Do they get, pick up a book? Do they have a conversation with somebody else? Broaden the horizon. Yeah. Broaden how I think. Uh, uh, Mortimer Adler, I say it all the time, six great ideas. You know, the most important part of education is teaching a child how to think. I Not what to think. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that we, um, it's critical. And, and uh, learning those critical thinking skills um, are, are, are key to, a, to healthy uh, childhood, getting them ready to sco uh, for school. And mm -hmm. also for our prime, prime time schedule, it's when you're older, you still need to think. Uh, issues still uh, are important sure. and you need different perspectives and we're there mm -hmm. to provide alternative perspectives and to dig deeper into a lot it's of issues of our time. It's the on the stake really. It's the, if you don't understand nuclear power, you could, you could watch a show on nuclear power so that you can make a decision on whether or not you think nuclear energy is a good or bad idea. That makes sense? Yeah, or, or you can watch a historical show that says um, here's, here's how we've developed um, uh, power on a massive scale mm. from electricity to coal sure. to oil to nuclear power. Sure, now, because now, knowledge is power. Yeah. Who, I don't know who said that, somebody smarter than I. <laughs> well, we, we have a wall that has, 50, I think, 50 or 60 great sayings, and I can't uh -huh. remember because it goes from Einstein to Jimi Hendrix to and, Right. And to Are you Abba doing any talk shows at Knowledge? <laughs> no, we're not. Well, just in case Mr. Shaw boots me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, glad. Anytime. Okay. Nice to meet you. Thank you very Again. much. Thank you. Arudi Butnall, he is the uh, president and CEO of Knowledge Network.